Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those who are attending this India 101 session at the ASU GSV Summit. This is the first time that we are actually having this deep 101 India session and I'm extremely uh, privileged to uh, have uh, started this uh, session and presenting to you everything about India. Uh, I'm extremely privileged to be doing this along with my uh, colleagues and panelists who are on this session who will follow. But uh, for now, uh, let me just dive in and talk about India. Uh, there has been a lot of conversation about India all over the world at this point in time. And the most important thing is that it is one of the largest consumer markets in the world. It's a new center of gravity. Let's look at it. It's the second global internet user base. It has over 650 million active internet users and has 50% internet penetration with a population of 1.3 billion people and having an urban population of 517 million. And 40% of these people living in mega cities by 2030. Let's look at some numbers, 2.6 trillion GDP. GDP is growing 6X or rather has grown 6X in just two short decades from 1998 to 2018. 10% nominal GDP rate for 2021. Enormous numbers, the center of gravity as far as the world is concerned. Let's look at the labor force generating a strong momentum. The population of India, the youth population, 65% of the population is below the year, 35 years of age. The labor force, as it expands, is expected to touch 160 to 170 million in 2020, by end of 2020. Has a high population growth, has an increased labor participation, and huge expanded education enrollment. The overall labor force participation is expected to reach 52% by the end of 2020, with 12 million jobs being created in the last five years. I think we should look at some of these indexes. Global Manufacturing Index 2020, number three of 48, up 27 places. The Global Innovation Index 2020, number 48 out of 129, up four places. Ease of Doing Business Index, up 14 places to 63 out of 190 countries and the Global Talent Competitiveness Index, India up 80 place, eight places, 8%, eight, eight place points, uh, 72 out of 132. So as we talk about India, it's a strong labor force generating an extremely strong momentum. Let's talk about the startup market. It's an extremely high growth startup market. It ranks number three in the world and is expected to see a year-on-year -year growth of 12 to 15 percent. India has 10 unicorns and over 9 billion of capital invested in Indian startups. That's something which is phenomenal. In the last year, we had about 1,300 new tech startups which were born, and that's about two to three per day. The startup ecosystem is being fueled by over 280 plus incubators, accelerators across the country, co-working spaces with over 40% growth year on year. Staggering numbers for anyone who's looking at India as a potential market. Angel investments are on the rise with 20% increase in active investors. Investors such as Alibaba, SoftBank, Sequoia, have significantly invested uh, in the startup ecosystem. Therefore, India is considered to be a high opportunity market. We identified four key areas which we believe which will drive growth for India and for companies that look at India. One is healthcare. One, second one is obviously education. Third one is e-commerce. 
and the fourth one is gaming. Let's look at healthcare. It's about 230 billion in 2019 and expected to reach about 372 billion by 2022. The fourth largest medical device market in Asia. And as we work through different markets at our company in Brand Capital International, we do see a number of medical device companies looking at India in the next couple of years, which is extremely positive. Let's jump into education, $101 billion market in 2019, the second largest market for e-learning after the United States. And e-learning is expected to grow by 40% in the next two to four years. Once again, staggering. What about e-commerce? 50 billion in 2018, growing at about a 31% uh, uh, CAGR uh, in the next four years. And it's expected to be about 200 billion by 2026. Once again, gaming, a 1.1 billion in 2019 with a CAGR of about 22% between 2018 and 2023, which has a user base of over 620 million people. So these numbers, which you see in each of these sectors are really, really staggering numbers. And it, when, when, when companies which are outside India look at it, they believe that this is the new market that they need to look at and probably validates why we have uh, India sessions specifically with several other sessions uh, about India in the next coming days at the ASU GSV summit. So what does the road look like? It's a booming road ahead. The GDP is expected to reach 5 trillion by financial year 2025. The upper middle income status uh, is growing significantly on the back of digitization, globalization, and generally favorable demographics and reforms, which are being driven by uh, the current government in power. It's expected to be the third largest consumer economy as its consumption may triple to 4 trillion by 2005, owing to shift in consumer behavior and expenditure patterns. And finally, it's estimated to surpass USA to become the second largest economy in terms of purchasing power and parity by 2040. So what I want to say out here is that as we get deeper into this panel session, these are some of the numbers that you need to look at and remember as to why India is important uh, for any global player to look at. We expect that during the se several sessions we have on India, uh, we would be able to flesh out various uh, different parts of it for it for people to know as to why India needs to be there in the top three countries of any company that is looking at expanding globally. With that, let me uh, hand over this uh, session to Kami and who will then introduce uh, all the panelists for the panel session. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Neville. Um, over the past two years, uh, India has been emerging as a massive market for digital learning and ed tech. And it would be fair to say that the last six months has accelerated this trend by four to five times. There has been a remarkable growth in ed tech users and spending. New segments of learning and learners are emerging, and we've seen close to $800 million of venture capital investment in ed tech companies in just the first half of this year. So what we'd like to do in this session is to try and understand the underlying factors that make India such a great opportunity in education and talent and discuss how the market will evolve uh, from here. I'm Kami Vishwanathan, uh, founder of Work for Porno Capital and a member of the advisory board at GSV Ventures. And we have an amazing group of entrepreneurs on our panel. Um, if we could do a very quick round of introductions, um, Zishan, if I may request you to start. I am Zishan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Topper.com. Topper is an after-school learning app for K-12 in India, and we cater from grades 1 to 12 and help students learn all the subjects uh, in an adaptive way. Thank you, Zishan. Paru? Thanks, 
Kami. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Parul, the co-founder of Springboard. We offer online courses with one-on-one -on -one mentoring and a job guarantee to help people break into in-demand tech careers. We are based in San Francisco. Over the last seven years, have helped over 20,000 uh, students in over 100 countries in the world. And last year, we launched our offerings customized for India at our first international market. Awesome. Uh, Kavish? Hi, uh, I'm Kavish, the co-founder and CEO of Stones to Milestones, a company which is simply focused on giving children their first learning edge by getting them adapt with English. And for that, we, we use our full stack solution across ages 3 to uh, K-12. And currently, we do it in India. We wish to take this to become the global gold standard in English. Awesome. Uh, finally, Charu. Charu, unmute. Hi, uh, I'm Charu Noheria. I'm the co-founder of Practically. We are an immersive experiential app uh, catering to uh, grade 6 to 12 in the STEM segment. We are currently uh, in India and Middle East, uh, based out of uh, Hyderabad uh, in India. And uh, we have more than 200,000 students uh, onboarded uh, across, uh, you know, from uh, medium and uh, high tier uh, segment of schools. Uh, we bring, uh, you know, experiential learning, uh, kind of learning by doing uh, philosophy uh, to a much more traditional and conventional uh, learning, right? Just to kind of spring it up. So you'll hear more about it. Thank you. Um, th thank you all for, for joining us. And um, so we'll divide up this discussion into two parts and talk first about K-12 and then about higher ed and workforce. And, and just to set some context before I uh, bring our panelists in, uh, India is one of the largest K-12 markets in the world with enrollment of over 250 million. And over the years, uh, we've had several challenges in the formal education system. We have over a 1.5 million schools, many of which are very small. And while enrollment has been increasing, learning uh, levels and outcomes have not. On the other hand, we've seen some remarkable um, developments in consumer technology adoption uh, with greater mobile phone penetration, uh, low cost data availability and a um, robust digital payments um, infrastructure. And, and forerunners like Byju's have established that there is a growing consumer demand for supplemental education products. So as a result, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, we've seen EdTech really take off. Um, and EdTech users are slated to grow four times over the next three years to over 100 million. And at tech spending is slated to grow at an annual rate of 85%. Uh, percent. So um, Zishan, uh, if I may start with you, as a leader in K-12 in test prep, how have you seen this market evolve? So we started building Topper seven years ago, and it was difficult to imagine the depth of uh, users for an online format of learning. Uh, at that time, a million active users monthly would have been like a big goal. Uh, a year ago, our site had 4 million monthly active users. And today we have 30 million monthly active users. So it's really been an exponential curve, right? So over the last 12 months, uh, use, users have grown literally 8x uh, just in 12 months. And what we're seeing right now is we are now reaching about 100 million active users in India using our site. And I'm guessing if we combine all the edtech sites together, we probably have close to 150 million unique edtech users, which is roughly one fourth of our internet user population. So we're seeing penetration levels for edtech products already at 25%, uh, which is huge because you know you have to see it in context. Five years ago, this was literally not the case, right? Five years ago to convince someone that you could learn online was a challenge. And today we have north of 100 million yearly active users and 30 million monthly active users on a single platform. And there are probably larger platforms and topper out there. So it's huge. Uh, what it does is it literally opens up the access immediately. So usually access is a very linear curve for users. So people with uh, maximum resources have the highest access and it gradually keeps coming down. What it immediately does is it creates like a step curve. Uh, so either people have a device and internet and therefore have the equal access of quality or they don't have access. So we'll solve the, I don't have a device and therefore don't have access in a bit, but 
right now what is happening is we sort of leveling the quality for everybody who has access is though there's no difference between a great after school learning experience versus a very poor after school learning experience so that's that's uh, rapidly changing and because of that uh, there is today for exam prep or for test prep preparing without a digital solution is pretty much unfathomable uh, so you have some digital phase in your learning a lot of students are actually learning completely digitally so almost all our users now use stopper as the only learning tool after school learning tool uh, beyond schools so they don't go to coaching classes they don't do tuitions they just use stopper as a learning tool but i want to say that everyone is using some amount of digital tools uh, for learning today uh, so yeah yeah no i think that's great and um so so in terms of the product itself initially um digital learning was primarily about content right um how have you seen that evolve um have you also then seen sort of services and more interactivity and community being built in how has the product itself evolved yeah so uh actually we took a full stack product approach with multiple layers and of all the layers just content as a layer has been the lowest priority for us because we feel that content is available everywhere in bits and pieces it may not be organized but it is definitely out there so it's available if you search for it so content is the lowest commodity uh, in in the entire stack i think what users experience is uh, either adaptive or community support right so these two things and comprehensiveness of course but of all these three uh, an adaptive platform and community support for instant doubt resolution or having access to the best teachers these two play the most important role uh, and they navigate their journey with the help of uh, you know laid out goals in an adaptive way and keep seeking community support so i think these two uh, definitely define how a tech stacks are being designed right and i think that also reflects the sort of greater focus on learning outcomes uh from these uh products um so schools have remained largely um outside the edtech and supplemental content um wave uh, do you see that changing going forward yes yes absolutely so what this pandemic has done is it's a, it's done two things one parents are now exposed to what happens inside a school because parents are literally standing over a student's shoulder and for the first time they're seeing how teachers teach what is the capability of a classroom you know what's being delivered and this is probably happening for the first time and second thing that has happened is all the teachers have been forced into a you know forced training program of over 150 days now of teaching digitally so you know teachers in over 40 years 50 years 60 years are now uh, you know using digital tools and not not for a week long thing like right? it's a sustained thing so these two things have literally forced the hand of schools to adopt tech solutions um, and we opened up our platform to schools uh, 150 schools are running on the platform digitally completely you know starting morning prayers to evening national anthems um 300000 children log in simultaneously and you know start their uh, classes i don't know what will happen once the pandemic goes away but i it's very difficult to imagine that again digital traces won't be left in the schooling system right so they once they are here it's very difficult to completely go back to analog schooling um so yeah it's it's schools have been very resistant to technology but that has significantly changed over the last 6 months right and and looking forward from here what what is your sense of what are some of the areas that you might uh, want to focus on so i think we are uh, we are fairly deep into the curriculum learning and but on the extra curricular learning i think we're still scratching the surface uh i think on the coding side we're still scratching the surface and it's emerging as one of the key extra curricular activities that families want to pursue the other activity that i think will be a big win will be english learning beyond the school program right so beyond the english that you want to learn in school i think a lot more families will want to learn english after school as well and uh, because i think that's the biggest edge that any uh, you can give to any child uh, english literally defines where you end up in your career right more than math and science uh, I, i think it's it, english is a binary thing once you know english and then you know math and science is then you make a career out of it so Uh, i think these two things i'm um very bullish and long on yeah 
And, and are you also thinking about moving outside of India, uh, international expansion? Right now, we're just being reactive. Right now, we're getting a lot of uh, queries from the subcontinent. So Nepal, Sri Lanka, sometimes Pakistan. So we're just reacting, uh, sometimes Africa as well. Uh, so we are just reacting right now and you know, opening up solutions to limited partners, but we don't have a strong go-to for this year and next year at the very least, because the Indian market is pretty deep. We want to focus on the Indian market and get this done over the next two years before we want to expand internationally with a formal structure. Terrific. Um, yeah, you talked about English learning and, you know, I want to sort of uh, segue to, to Kavish here. Um, English has been an enabler, right, for personal and professional mobility in India. So, so Kavish, how large is the language learning market in India and, and how are you um, at Stones to Milestones addressing it? Thank you, Kami, and thank you, Jishan, for setting that up uh, for English. In fact, 30 years ago, when I went to school, uh, more than 30 years ago, I was in, amongst the first few kids who get, got an opportunity to learn in an English medium school. And within six months, my headmaster told me, can you teach English to your own class? Because apparently our teacher was not yet ready to teach English in the school I was. Right now, if you look at it, majority of the country is signing up for English medium schools. Uh, when they are going to English medium schools, is our infrastructure ready to serve these learners? Not necessarily, partly because of two reasons. One, the academic sprint around getting to do well in English as a subject is very different from acquiring English as a necessary life skill. For you to be able to become a lifelong learner, definitely English does give you a social and economic edge, which is very much established uh, currently in the digitized world. So if you look at market sizing, before I come to what we do, China uh, till about recently was about a $3 billion market by itself. And India is expected to have a 30 to 35% share of the APAC market in the next three to five years, uh, which is estimated at around $6 billion, right? And where does that come from? I think primarily 60% of that market share or more is going to be in the primary school years. The first time learners into a formal system would love to first get themselves to conquer English as a language so that they can learn everything else at school and beyond school. So that's the definite uh, market sizing that we're estimating. At Stones to Milestones, we have been in it as a research company for more than a decade. And the last three years, we have built our research out in the form of a full stack product, which is currently a multi-layer from pedagogy, assessment, AI engine, personalization, going on to becoming the full stack solution. Uh, we are working primarily with ages three to 12 currently in India. In the next 12 months, we expect to move beyond ages 12 because we feel that there is a significant opportunity in not just getting first language learners learn English, but also get some children into TEDx and podcast channels. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. You mentioned full stack as well, uh, you know, similar to what, what Zishan was talking about. Um, but, but, you know, you talked about the large market size. Um, how easy or hard is it to monetize uh, this market? Because language learning has been a challenging area for, for most players to, to build a revenue model with. And I think that's where the full stack makes sense. Because if you as a provider can take control of the complete learning outcome for your learners, you will be able to get a first generation learner learn their first words in English. You would be able to serve a learner who's in an urban setup want to build a social and global connect to become a global citizen. So I think monetization wise, there are two significant things we need to focus on as tech companies. One, can we promise a learning outcome and deliver that within the committed promise timeline to the user? And second, can we make it like a super personalized experience? Because every child is at a very different scale when it comes to their exposure to English as a language before they come into formal learning. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, so Charu, moving on to you, um, you work with um, schools providing AR and, and VR uh, content, curricular content, right? Um, so how does your product bridge the learning gap that we talked about um, at the beginning? Charu, you're on mute. Yeah, so Kami, our product uh, is aimed to kind of redefine the way we fundamentally learn. Uh, so, you know, we make learning by doing possible. And my favorite and a little too perfect line, uh, you know, learning is an experience and everything else is information. Actually, Einstein said so. Uh, so we bring life to learning 
taking both the teacher and the learner away from the uh, kind of mundane traditional classroom into the next generation modern classroom and uh, practically bridges the gap between passive and active learning and we aim to take the attention retention rate right the retention rate of concepts after two weeks if you measure that to more than 90 percent so with experiential learning uh, using vfx uh, technologies ai interactive simulations ar and vr uh, we can create mind-blowing experiences and uh, yet be focused on delivering uh, you know certain curriculum but in a less structured way to keep the curiosity at the center of the experience great um, and, and what has been your experience uh, taking emerging technologies like AR and VR um, into market in India? Um, so what we've realized is uh, that today, a certain set of features in EdTech are like check boxes, like live classes, doubt clearance, test prep, etc. In fact, we as a company six years ago started as a test prep assessments product. Uh, and most big players, you know, in the market have these because these are the building blocks of a full fledged uh, e learning platform. Uh, we as a company decided to go one step further, right, uh, by converting our product into an experiential learning platform uh, with interactive simulations, AR and VR enabling us to accomplish that shift. Uh, now, when you are entering a large and an emerging market like India, uh, where well funded big players call the shots. Uh, AR and VR are, you know, key to gather that interest, uh, you know, from students, teachers and parents alike beyond what's already available, right? So now what leaves them in disbelief uh, is taking them through an experience that they've never seen or imagined before, right? And that's what practically is all about and leaving them wowed with a stress-free feeling, with a feeling of well-being and elation. Uh, and India is a very, very interesting market, Kami. And, uh, you know, in our experience, if you talk to schools, uh, educators around the world, in fact, don't have access to experiential tools uh, to make their uh, classes engaging and experiential. Uh, so practically is the only experiential tool which also bridges, the, you know, the gap between school and after school. Uh, we don't compete with the teacher or replace the teacher because it's just the way the content and a product is envisioned. Uh, you know, we have a very successful, uh, you know, uh, ex you know, market, uh, you know, which we've created for ourselves as a niche, niche market, uh, right, where experiential products, uh, product and experiences at the core. Uh, we've onboarded more than 200k students. We are, you know, in early in our journey, uh, but we've launched, uh, you know, India and Middle East together, um, you know, because ours is uh, very easily localizable and it's a global product, right? We want to go after the make in India, go global uh, philosophy and with India's national education policy uh, coming in revolving around experiential learning and moving away from rote learning uh, you know and with recent acquisition of uh, lab and app with Baiju's by Baiju's uh, just is a beginning of how modern methods of learning are going uh, to be the next wave of edtech right and I don't think I'm going too far in saying that we are the business class of edtech with an economy class price tag so uh, we'll see, but it's an interesting space out there to be, you know, and largely unexplored. Yeah, it sounds like a lot more to come in the in the coming years. Yeah. Um, moving on to um, higher ed and, and workforce, and, and again, uh, to do a bit of context setting um, before I, I invite Parul uh, to weigh in, um, over 80% of India's engineering graduates are reported unemployable, and India ranks pretty low on skill ratings across the board. Um, we have uh, over 50,000 higher ed institutions, but except for a small number of top tier, uh, highly selective institutions, the quality of education is variable and, and many colleges suffer from lack of funding and good governance and, and so on. So there is a huge demand supply uh, gap. And the new education policy, which came out earlier this year, um, has provided a greater push towards uh, enrollment in higher ed and also uh, building flexibility um, in, in higher ed um, and select institutions are now allowed to offer online uh, degrees. Um, so EdTech has taken off and, and is taking off in higher ed and workforce uh, as well. And the market is slated to grow 50% annually over the next uh, three years. So, so Parul, um, Springboard started in the US market, right? And you've recently seen uh, good traction in India. So, so tell us a little bit about the market need uh, that you're addressing and your approach uh, in the India market. 
Sure, Kami. So I'll start with the market need and you gave a, a particular perspective about the skills gap or the employability issue at the entry level amongst college grads. There's another big problem, which I'm sure all of us would agree that, you know, the modern workplace is evolving very rapidly and the continuous uh, reskilling and upskilling uh, need the need for that is no longer a nice to have but it is an imperative for all working professionals to stay relevant in their careers and just to give you a sense of the numbers in India uh, there was a recent study by NASCOM which found that about the four uh, four million of India's IT workforce will need to be reskilled uh, or upskilled in the next five years and in 2022 alone, we'll have a shortage or a demand for 6 million uh, professionals in cybersecurity alone. So the, if anything, COVID has accelerated this trend, the move to digital and the need for skills in tech. And that is what we are trying to bridge. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the approach that you, um, as a company that started out in the US, have taken in India in terms of is there a level of customization um, or in terms of product or pricing? How, how have you thought about the India market? Yeah, so to set context about what we tried in the US and then how we had to adapt it for India. So when we talk about bridging the need uh, for the employer skills gap, we really have to work backwards from what employers are looking for. And that's what we've done uh, in our programs. We start with combing through uh, job descriptions where employers are seeing a skills gap and then conduct dozens of hiring manager interviews to map out the skills that they would like to see in candidates and work backwards from there to build a project-based curriculum. Then another thing that we have to keep in mind is we are building for the needs of busy working professionals. This is no longer the 18 to 20 year old who goes to college and can design their lives around the learning experience. It's professionals who uh, need to fit in this learning into their schedules. And that's why human support and guidance, um, mentorship and career placement support, not only for keeping them accountable towards their goals, but also helping them get unstuck is really key. So this was our model in the US, which worked really well. And then when we brought the same thing in India with the same career outcomes focus, we realized that we needed a few uh, adaptations or changes. So particularly the learners in India uh, have a preference for a little more structured learning with a little more handholding than our completely uh, um, sort of self-paced flipped cl classroom model that we have in India. So going from the flipped classroom model in India, when we launched, we have introduced uh, kind of a, a blended model with one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship, but also live lectures, particularly for concepts where students uh, need more structured learning. And in terms of pricing, we have adapted our courses to be more affordable for the Indian audiences. Our courses in India cost about a third of what they cost in the US. And also the uh, students are paired with mentors who have context about the job market in India, career coaches who understand the landscape a little more uh, closely. And that's those are some examples of a few changes we've made for the local market. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that your pricing is a third of what it is in the US, but it's still a, a high ticket item in India, right? Um, so is there a willingness to pay for um, high ticket learning courses in India? Yeah, absolutely. So if you can demonstrate outcomes, uh, then in a way the course would pay for itself by way of increased earnings. And that is the missing thing. In fact, uh, a recent report by Omidyar uh, showed that the, the willingness to pay amongst users for the right offering that provides assistance and tangible career outcomes is higher than what uh, current offerings are priced at. So that really is not a blocker. The key is to focus on outcomes. And that's why models like the income share agreements, uh, outcomes linked payment models, are, which have become really popular in the US are making their inroads in India as well. And that's how we also for our programs, we have a uh, 100% um, money back guarantee. You don't pay anything if you don't get a job. Right, right. So, so, you know, obviously a part of what you're trying to do is to bridge the gap between industry requirements and higher education, right? Um, so, so bring in some of the industry input in terms of mentoring and content and, and so on. Um, so, so as you think about scaling from here, 
Um, how important is that partnership with industry uh, going to be for you? Yeah, for us, it is absolutely critical, both for efficacy as well as for outcomes. And I can give a few examples of how this partnership with industry has really shaped how we deliver our programs. So first and foremost is the curriculum, like I mentioned earlier, working backwards from hiring manager requirements and mapping out skills that we teach. The second thing, and this is a pretty big shift in hiring, especially in tech, that employers more and more are looking for work products as a proof of competence, portfolios, and not just a credential. So it's no longer about where you got your degree or what degree you got, but what can you do? So uh, software engineers or data scientists will have GitHub portfolios, designers will be tested based on their Behance or Dribble portfolios and so on. So that is a new reality, and this is massively uh, becoming the norm in tech hiring. And that's why our programs are very project-based. Uh, in most of our courses, students do um, a few capstones and anywhere between 18 to 50 mini projects. And that is what goes into their portfolios to demonstrate they can really do the job. And then finally, but most importantly, every single one of our students is paired with an industry practitioner who's doing the job that they aspire to get into. So having that is the missing link, uh, which is uh, you know, not there in our traditional uh, university learning environments or even other online learning environments where if you can get feedback from people who are doing the job day in and day out, there's nothing better, better than that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and how do you see uh, skilling um, and, and early workforce uh, evolve from here? Uh, do you see an expansion in the areas that, that will be addressed? Um, how, how do you see that move from here? Yeah, so I really believe that we are in the very, very early days of uh, attacking the skills gap. And right now, if you see all of the action is con concentrated in a few areas in tech, it's mostly about coding, data, maybe a little bit about digital marketing and so on. But the skills gap uh, extends far beyond that. And we, for one, have seen really good success, both in the US and in India in our uh, UX and UI courses. So thanks to the digital transformation, all projects, uh, products going digital, there will be a need to help users navigate uh, that. And then another uh, area that's coming up, uh, again, uh, accelerated due to COVID is the need for cybersecurity specialists. And in the US particularly, um, we've also seen uh, sales boot camps or uh, programs which help place uh, people into sales jobs and particularly tech and B2B SaaS sales jobs have proven out success. And I feel that in India, uh, while this is not proven out, given the large amounts of uh, sales force that any consumer company has and B2B SaaS becoming a growing phenomenon, this will become um, uh, a big need as well. So overall, very bullish beyond the sectors where there's already concentrated action. Right. So, so sounds like both vertically as well as horizontally, there could be a lot of more uh, expansion of similar offerings um, in, in skilling. That's fantastic. Um, um, we, we have only a few minutes left, but uh, <clears throat> I want to um, sort of go around the panel and, and ask all of you, um, in your view, what is one big way uh, in which EdTech could transform um, education in India and more globally? Zishan, um, do you want to start us off? So I think personalization, uh, that's the that's the biggest thing that we're solving for. I would say quality is given because, you know, it's, it's just going to be equal for everyone. But personalization will help fast kids become faster, you know, average kids be, catch up with more effort. So it's all about making it adaptive. Great. Uh, Kavish? Yeah, just to add to personalization, I would add the word depth. If you could own up that one learning outcome and build your platform for a global play for serving needs across age stage of a user life cycle, I think that's truly the game changer. Yeah, Charu? Uh, so I think the most interesting thing I've heard in recent times is like in 2030, right? Not very far away from us, 100% uh, you know, of the jobs we are going to do in 2030, we don't, have in, we don't even understand the job description today, 
right? So that leads us to, uh, you know, and Parul, you have a great job to do there, yeah, right? <laughs> so looking into 10 years ahead. But um, uh, what I really, I think are, we have to set up our learners to become very agile and dynamic and learn on the go and that mindset, right? How do you, under, you know, so whatever we're teaching in curriculums today probably is not going to be relevant anymore, right? So how do you inculcate this feeling of entire learning through a new spectrum, right? And uh, I think it's very hard to do in traditional classrooms today. It's very hard to, do, in fact, do it in the current education system. So it's something systemically we have to look at, right? So I think their uh, startups and, you know, uh, uh, online products can really take that first step and then bring it back. Uh, to traditional because at any point in time, I don't think a teacher or a mentor relationship is going to go away, right? It is only going to get redefined. So I think that's where we can really, really help. Uh, Parul? Yeah. So Kami, I think going back to the point of lifelong learning, I feel what EdTech can really do is expand access, you know, with the uh, high penetration of the internet, uh, digital devices, you have learning at your disposal, wherever you are, anytime, anywhere. And that is, I think, the most powerful uh, thing that uh, regardless of where you are, what classrooms or environments you might have access to, everybody can learn if they have the motivation to do so. Yeah, yeah. I think two of the threads that I heard through all of uh, what you guys talked about was, so, so one is full stack, which is providing the entire learning experience. And the second is convergence between school and after school in the K-12 context. Um, so do you think we might have online schools and online colleges in India in the near future, assuming the regulatory environment supports it? Any thoughts, Sishan? Yeah, the assuming the regulatory environment supports it is the big clause. But I think if that is removed, I think people, several teams are actually raring to go there. There are so many thinkers around micro schools. There are so many thinkers around online schools. And actually, it's possible now because over the last decade, we've built so much technology and so much content that putting together a school is probably a year's job. So it's just probably one year away as long as we have the regulatory approval. Yeah. Anyone else? Parul? Yeah, I think uh, Kami in India, uh, actually the regulatory environment is now starting to open up. So earlier this year in the union budget, uh, online degrees were legitimized for the top 100 ranked institutions. And that's a pretty massive opportunity. The opium industry in the US and worldwide is pretty established. In fact, to the point that it's saturated, but it's just starting off in India. So really excited about that. Awesome. Uh, just to add to that, Kami, as in I think the parallel is the brick and mortar retail and e-commerce. Similarly, the brick and mortar schools will give you certain experiences, but a large part of it would be taken up by EdTech solutions. So just to quote, uh, add to that, uh, I think 10 years down the road, there was some, some study I read that, uh, read that said the largest company, it's, uh, you know, 10, 10 years later is not going to be like an e-commerce or Amazon or the Googles of the world. It's going to be an online school. Right. So that's pretty powerful as a vision. And, you know, for everybody in the education sector it should keep them excited. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, interesting. Terrific. So on that note, um, we're just about out of time. Uh, but thanks for a terrific discussion. Uh, really appreciate your insights from on the ground.